I'll just unmute so that I don't forget to unmute. Do you guys start right on time? No, I don't know if there's anyone on Zoom. I think most of those are people here. Yeah. Live streamed on YouTube. Maybe the first time I'm live on YouTube. Well, I think to be on, on YouTube, you no, gotta be like no, in the. <laughs> I have no idea. So I can't even say we just know each other for ages because of conference. And we're in the we're same in the field. field. So that's clear. You invited me to your tell your ride meeting. That's right. In 2017. I think that's like the first time I interacted with you in person. I don't think that's true, but anyway, that's okay. That's not really? I did it with Asna. It's been a fun that, story. That's like, I don't think that's fun. No, that's like the first moment I recollect, like, discussing you science with you. I feel like I proposed to because we knew each other. Anyway. We'll get there. We'll get there. Yes. Crystal growth. Yeah, yeah, we have to discuss crystal growth. I have to convince him to do, yes, I have to get him to. This year, actually, you'll talk with a bunch of people also who may not be in the iQuest because that's the problem. It's all kind of siloed. And that's the question. Okay, I don't know. Teach and all Got it. Okay, maybe give it like one moment. I feel like people are still, still trickling in. Yeah, people are like still walking in. I know. Reese. By the way, the pronunciation that they always get wrong with me. They say Schlieff. It's exactly the EI combination. I thought it's the German way is Reese. Rice. Rice. Okay, then it's it's a it's it's a German way then. Whichever one is the correct German way. I see. No, I like I versus I. Okay, so I've been US, like exactly the opposite, I yeah, know. I've been messing it up then. So wonderful. I at least some I'll I'll figure it out. You know, should at least know how to pronounce the name of the chair that I hold. That would be a good. And then it's my distinct pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Professor Prini Hanarang. Uh, Pri is at uh, UCLA, where she holds the uh, Howard Price uh, Chair in. Speaking a few, uh, one. Um, that is also a Max Planck. Review and a leading young scientist by the World Economic Forum. And she chaired the spring meeting of the MRS in, in Hawaii earlier this year. Um, she's an editor. She's very active in the community, but today we're going to hear about her exciting science built of, of quantum information, and, and Pri will talk about building blocks of uh, scalable quantum technology. So please do. So, all right. So thank you so much for, for the introduction, and thank you again for, for being here. This is the first talk I've given with two mics on, so one for folks on Zoom and one in, in person. Um, I'm really excited to, to be here and, and spend the you know, next couple of days getting a chance to, to know some of you and, and talk about the work uh, that we're doing in, in the group. Today's talk will primarily focus on 
cloud technologies, building blocks, thinking about how we can go from qubit to, to protocol. My talk tomorrow will be more on the non-equilibrium stuff. So if you're here to listen to the non-equilibrium stuff, you have to wait for about 24 more hours. Okay. So uh, with that, let me first acknowledge the people who've done this work with me, uh, the students and postdocs, many of whom have now gone on to, to start their own groups. The work I'll talk about today was uh, primarily done by Chris Ciccarino. Um, he just graduated from my group and is starting as a, a Price postdoc at Stanford. Uh, so the work that I'll talk about also done by Johannes Flick, uh, Derek Wong, um, who's now at uh, IBM, and um, Kadehad Marsden, who just started her own group at the University of uh, um, Washington in St. Louis. Okay, so, you know, okay, and this worked just fine like a second ago, and now it is not. All right, so when we think about the building blocks of scalable quantum technologies, I think there are, there are various pieces to it, and this is very much a theorist view of what needs to happen in order for us to get to scalable quantum networks, um, quantum sensing, and, and quantum computing, right? So there are folks here in the audience who actually think about this from a hardware standpoint. What we think about is how can we take a theory-driven approach to both predicting and controlling some of these building blocks so that we can overcome challenges that, that have uh, precluded quantum technologies from being as scalable as they could be as we want them to be, right? I won't tell you so much about the promise of quantum technologies. I think there's a lot out there. I've written about it, and some might say there's even too much out there about all the things that would happen when we have scalable networks, quantum computers, et cetera. Um, we'll take more of a, a, you know, how do we actually get there, and how does a, a theorist think we're going to get their uh, approach to it? So one of the, the things we think about a lot in my group is, you know, how can we actually make predictions in QED, particularly from an ab initio standpoint? So how do we treat photons, but also electrons and, and nuclei at the same level of quantization, such that we can actually capture correlated light matter interactions, right? So one of the reasons you'd want to do that, uh, you know, especially if you're, you're entering the field, is uh, the ways that we control various cross technologies involve, in some way or another, either a, a photon or, or a phonon, okay? at least the ones that, that we know of today. And um, in order to actually describe them at, at the same level of quantization, we actually need to, to go beyond what has been done in um, previous QED-related work. I'll, I'll convince you more of that in the next few slides. So some of the other things that we think about in my group are, you know, how do we understand correlated electronic structure methods to predict new kinds of uh, qubits? This is especially important where we're thinking about optically addressable spin qubits. We're thinking about uh, defects in solids that might act as the, the building block, say, of, of repeaters or new kinds of sensors. Um, when you try and take existing theoretical methods and directly apply them to these problems, they frequently fall short. So part of what we do in the group, actually, both in uh, ab initio QED and in correlated electronic structure, is develop new methods, develop new approaches, both theoretically and computationally. Of course, when we think about a quantum system, it's almost uh, uh, essential to think about the environment, to think about the bath. Uh, something that we've started to do in the past three or four years is really incorporate open systems approaches, right? This is where you're talking about a quantum system not only interacting with a bath as a one-way street, but where there's some backflow of information. So we've been thinking about how actually open systems approaches can allow us to, to get uh, further to scale, right? So you can think of the bath as a one-way street, sure, no problem. When you put that um, in, in different terms, you could also think of the bath as being a reservoir that, that the, the two-way street aspect makes uh, that reservoir actually useful to you, right? So, so we've been um, developing approaches in, in this uh, domain, and I'll tell you a fair bit about it uh, in the second half of my talk. Uh, this is the part that gets most uh, undergraduates excited these days when I show uh, a picture of a, a quantum algorithm, uh, very heuristically a circuit with, with something uh, on it. You know, So yes, we develop algorithms both for uh, existing classical supercomputers, the ones where a majority of our real work happens, as well as some small quantum devices, uh, ones where we can perhaps map a part of the problem. And this is a growing area, perhaps some of you work in this area, where you can actually divvy up an existing problem in correlated electronic structure, in even in open systems, and you can map it onto a small quantum device. And a small quantum device here 
uh, could be, you know, your, your favorite provider of, of uh, these noisy quantum devices, um, or it could even be something a little more boutique that sits in a, a colleague's lab where you're saying, okay, there's this very, very specific problem that I think I can uh, try on your uh, photonic uh, system. So we've been developing algorithms for that, and I'll hopefully have a, a chance to, to get to it uh, in my talk. Okay. So I said something that nobody, um, you know, was, was too offended by, but typically people are, that existing electronic structure methods fall short when we are thinking about predicting new kinds of uh, qubits. Usually uh, somebody stands up and says, well, no, what's, what's the problem, right? You're thinking about defects in solids or you're thinking about optical excitations. There's uh, been, been decades of, of work in, in that discipline. And uh, the answer is, well, yes, there has been decades of, of work. However, there are some gaps and, and those gaps are in fact exactly where uh, these, these building blocks of quantum technologies fall. Okay, so more concretely, what I'm trying to say is that uh, things on the left of the slides, right, uh, slide, things like uh, small clusters, thinking about you know, an, atom, um, an AMO type system, uh, these are, are problems that we can solve pretty well with methods in quantum chemistry uh, where you're you have some approach for, uh, say, a finite system. You can talk about the orbitals. You can talk about potential energy surfaces. You can do a lot of stuff, okay? And the types of acronyms that people throw around when you think of approaches for these finite systems are couple clusters, singles, doubles. People will tell you that's the gold standard. You can do configuration interaction. And if you get really, really fancy, you can do things at the level of DMRG. And these are methods that are, in principle, exact, in principle, very, very accurate. And they can tell you almost everything you want to know about the correlated nature of uh, the, these systems. Unfortunately, they do not scale. And, you know, we can debate as to exactly how many electrons or how many atoms you can incorporate in a particular calculation. But uh, generally speaking, you're, you're limited to finite systems. On the other end of the slide, you see methods uh, or, or questions that would, you know, be addressed in, say, materials physics, condensed matter theory, where we're looking at an extended solid. There's some notion of periodicity we can, we can uh, invoke. And actually, that makes many of these calculations quite tractable. However, um, there's a big gap between methods here and, and methods here, right? So, so thinking about a band structure, figuring out exactly which type of excitation is allowed, okay, no problem. But all of the things we're thinking about, say, for molecular qubits, all the things we're thinking about for uh, solid state spin qubits fall in the middle of this slide, right? This is where you might have a defect. It's sitting in uh, a solid. Maybe there are two of them. They're, they're sitting uh, some number of nanometers apart. They're talking to each other either via phonon mode or a magnon mode. Those are all uh, concrete examples of, of uh, proposed, um, you know, architectures that, that people are looking at. Um, but in that scenario, you have both the finite system aspect and you have this extended system simultaneously, right? So you want the level of accuracy you get from a quantum chemistry calculation. You want to know exactly um, the, the spin physics. You don't want to be off by um, 0.2 or 0.3 EV, which, by the way, is a perfectly reasonable, uh, you know, error in, in some of these band structure calculations. If you go tell your uh, colleague that, you know, your uh, zero phone online might be off by 0.2 EV, they, they look at you and say, oh, no, that's a, a complete disaster. I see somebody here in, in the front row who's, who's nodding, right? So, so there needs to be some way of harmonizing these methods and methods that come from the right of the slide for us to actually be able to make progress towards scalable uh, quantum technology. So, so hopefully I've convinced you that there is a reason for us to be developing new methods and extending existing methods uh, in order to actually think about uh, building blocks of, of quantum technologies. So there's one other component of this, and um, I just want to, you know, emphasize that even when it comes to QED, right, QED and, and things in quantum optics that have been around for a very, very long time, um, there are gaps that we are filling in at this intersection of correlated electronic structure and uh, QED, right? So all of those electronic structure methods, either uh, from uh, quantum chemistry or condensed matter that I pointed out, they frequently treat the, the photon as classical. And when we think about the photon in the context of quantum formation, we do not want it to be classical for the most part. We actually want to take the, the quantized nature of, of light uh, into account. 
So there has been a class of methods introduced that go beyond things like non-equilibrium Green's functions that are QED plus electronic structure, both formally and computational com computationally combining these uh, methods. And uh, I'll, I'll give you some concrete examples of where that's been you know, useful for us to, to access observables that you couldn't with those two methods being separated from each other. Okay, everyone with me so far? Yes, okay, I see students nodding, that's good. It's uh, all um, what I wanna see. So, so going from a single qubit, right? So everything I've said so far, you might say, okay, I understand that, but we have qubits, they exist, they're not great. Um, what, what's, what's the problem? Where's the scalable aspect? You, you use the word scalable in, in the, the title of your talk. Um, and this is something that you know, we and, and others in the field have uh, now, now been thinking about quite uh, extensively, which is, you know, how do we go from talking about predicting single qubits, uh, these single defects in uh, your, your favorite platform, diamond, silicon carbide, HBN, your favorite 2D material, to actually talking about multiple qubits that are coupled with each other and introducing things like entanglement measures, thinking about the external drive, all in a, a somewhat unified manner. So, so you have a way of saying something about the optoelectronic properties. You can say something about the spin physics. I want to take that further and say, okay, what kind of drive should I use and how should I couple these? What are these kinds of multi-qubit studies? So from a theory standpoint, that seems like a problem that is very well suited for this idea of quantum embedding, okay? If you haven't heard that word before, let me just uh, tell you uh, a little bit about it, right? So the idea is that these are all different levels of theory and different kinds of theories that operate at different length scales. You could combine them in a manner that is actually rigorous by essentially thinking of it as uh, uh, layers of an onion or um, you know, a nested doll, where you pick a core of the problem that you wanna do at a very high level of theory, and then you coarse grain out. Eventually you get to a point where you can even talk about you know, a classical drive and external control uh, without necessarily losing the, the inner core that needs to be quantum mechanical, okay? So this is um, something that we and, and others have, have been talking about, but it's particularly important when we think about a, a multi-qubit space. Okay, so let's make everything about this single um, spin qubit and, and everything we've been talking about a little more concrete, right? So we can uh, think of this uh, uh, lattice here. Everything is uh, uh, living in this uh, simple lattice, okay? In, a, in the context of a single qubit space, all I'd really be interested in is talking about um, the, the optical physics of, of that system, the, maybe the, the spin, uh, perhaps I'm looking at something that's not isotopically pure, so I have both the electron and, and the uh, nucleus spin to, to worry about. But in this multi-qubit space, I need to not only take these two into account, but I also need to take into account how they're going to be coupled to each other. They could be coupled uh, directly via the lattice. They could be some dipole-dipole coupling. They could be some phonon-mediated coupling. Perhaps I could access an external cavity mode or uh, an external magnon mode. I I'll give you uh, concrete examples of uh, the la last two in, in a, a few slides. So um, great, so I have my qubits, I have uh, something associated with the bath, and finally I have some control thing, right? So, so why do I need a control here also incorporated into my theory? Well, if I talk about initializing these qubits or I talk about actually running some small protocol on them, I ought to be able to control them, right? Uh, otherwise, the, the whole thing is static, it exists, but I'm not actually doing something useful with it. Um, and this is actually quite exciting because the types of controls you design for different kinds of qubits are, um, can, can be very, very different. And there's a very um, exciting intersection with uh, methods in uh, physics-inspired physics ML, uh, where you kind of combine the best of, you know, the, the physical intuition you have from setting up this uh, Hamiltonian all the way to actually um, being able to identify the right parameter space of where this control should live, okay? So this is an argument for why you need to go all the way from qubit to protocol, why actually divvying up the problem into uh, different segments and hoping it all comes together at the very end is maybe uh, not, not the, the right way to go. Okay. So the, the first thing that um, I'll, I'll tell you about in, in some detail now is the scenario where we're trying to identify new kinds of optically addressable uh, spin qubits and trying to actually figure out first, what is the source of emission, right? If it is uh, this uh, nice uh, optical uh, system that, that I'm talking about, and then how can I actually say something about the spin physics, including talking about the decoherence concretely from a theory perspective, right? So, Everything I've said so far has been both for 2D and 3D. I'm going to now deep dive into talking about um, 
2D systems, so two-dimensional systems, and these are defects that live in, in these 2D materials that could actually themselves act as these artificial atom qubits. Okay? Has everyone heard the phrase artificial atom qubits um, trapped in solids before at, at one of these other iQuest talks? Okay, great, excellent. So I, I won't need to, to dive into to detail on that. Okay, so when folks first started looking at these artificial atom qubits in 2D materials, my material science friends would say, yes, 2D materials have lots of defects. So what's, what's the point, right? They have defects. Um, maybe some of them are qubits, but most of them are just defects, right? So how would you actually figure out what is, what's the qubit here and what's everything else? This is a particularly exciting question for 2D materials because in 2D materials, uh, things like HBN, things like the transitional metal dichalcogenides, you not only have a defect, you also have uh, the possibility of these other optically addressable collective excitations giving you rise to, to giving rise to this emission, right? And one of those is a uh, so-called exciton, right? This is a bound electron hole pair, and you can get uh, photons out. And it looks very similar to the kind of emission you would get from uh, a, a defect that exists. And in fact, you could have a combination of these. You could have a defect that is uh, sitting right next to an exciton, or you could have an exciton that's bound somehow by the presence of this defect, right? And, and all of those would give you very similar looking signatures. So we set about uh, doing uh, in, in the, the first few uh, iterations of uh, the, this project was actually trying to identify, right, if you're looking at a spectrum like this, right, you see something this very, very broad uh, zero phone online, uh, folks who come from, you know, uh, diamond or silicon carbide background uh, look at this and say, oh my gosh, there's no way this will ever be useful. But, you know, people who come from an HBN background look at this, exactly boron nitride, look at this and say, oh, that's a very nice uh, ZPL. And then you see, you know, a bunch happening here in, in the phonon sideband. Um, similarly, if you look at the spectrum for something that's happening in a monolayer or a few layer uh, um, transition metal dichalcogenide, you see um, localized peaks. Those are what you expect to see for, for zero phone online. This is where, this is the emission you want coming out of your uh, uh, defect, but you, you don't want everything else happening uh, as well. At this point, I'm going to ignore the spin physics. First, talk about the optical aspect, and then I'll get to the spin physics, okay? So this is a little sleight of hand I always do where I talk about optically addressable spin qubit, and then I split it up into two parts. But um, I, I'll, I'm calling it out before, so it's, it's not a true sleight of hand. Okay, so, so we want to be able to distinguish these defect states and these bound excitons. We want to be able to do that not only for a nice system like hexagonal boron nitride, it's a wide gap, it's, it's a, you know, a very stable system, but also for slightly more nuanced systems like these transition metal dichalcogenides. So when you think about these, right, there are many options, right? So there's the, the interaction of the environment, there are some long range ripples, uh, substrates, all, all kinds of things uh, can happen. Um, so for HBN in particular, we were very excited that, you know, there are all these reports of room temperature, um, very stable emission from HBN and, and, you know, reports of ODMR. So, so we start to try and say, can we actually identify which defect, which kind of defect is emitting and why? And can it actually, can that give us design principles for other systems that might have a, a similar, uh, you know, similar property or, or some, some guiding principle that we could then generalize? Okay, so um, our technique of choice in order to do this uh, from, and this is working in, in collaboration with uh, experimental colleagues, was to try and do correlated um, cathodoluminescence, photoluminescence in a, a stem column. Why? Right, I have this material, it has defects. I actually wanna be able to figure out what is the source of emission, right? So the emission is something I would measure as, as photoluminescence. Uh, a combination of stem plus cathodoluminescence should give me the ability to actually figure out what is the defect. Now in principle, right, this is a theorist view of the world. You would look at this sample with all of these techniques, you'd know the emission is coming from here, this is the structure of the defect. We'd all call it a day, one paper done, problem solved. Not that simple, because as it happens, each of these uh, techniques measures a slightly different volume, but it does allow us to say what are the things that are not emitting in hexagonal boron nitride, right? So if you read some of the papers on HBN and you look at some of the spectra, you see emission everywhere, and you might think that every emitter in HBN is a great, uh, um, you know, interesting quantum defect. And as it happens, uh, that's, that's not necessarily the case. But there's one other factor that could maybe make all of those uh, things uh, essentially, you know, all of those complications go away, you could say, well, maybe it's just strain. Maybe it's the one defect and it's differently strained and it's all over the spectrum, 
right? So we want to be able to eliminate that uh, possibility as, as well. And, and all of that is something that is possible in, in the context of such a STEM measurement, because you can also look at a strain map and try and correlate that exactly with what you're predicting from theory. Aha, theory, right? So what am I really predicting here? I can predict all the kinds of defects, right, that are thermodynamically possible in this uh, hexagonal boron nitride, right? So that's good. I can also tell you exactly how um, one of these defects, or each of these individually, I'm sorry, would look like when it's emitting, right? So I can tell you if all you saw was emission from that, where would it sit, okay? I can superimpose on top of that, what does strain do to it? So this is all moving towards saying, can I come up with a fingerprint for all of these put together and, and figure out exactly uh, what is responsible for, for emission? Okay, so I can do that for, for all the uh, candidate defects in, in HBN. But the other thing I can do, right, and this is something that if you're familiar with the cathodal luminescence measurement, you'd say, okay, you also need a set of defects that are very robust because you're probing them with an electron beam, and then you're also looking at the photoluminescence from them, right? So something that doesn't move around too much, because otherwise, if it moves under the beam, then it's, it's gone, and you're not actually looking at the same uh, defect again. So with all of those constraints and being able to predict that from a, a theory standpoint, I can then um, ask the, so the first author here, Faria, hey, Faria, can you actually send me all of the, the measured strain maps and we can correlate the two and tell you exactly which defect it is. It's like a fingerprinting technique, right? It's like those like spy movies where, where they do all this analysis and boom, that's the person. Okay, so science unfortunately is not quite that clean, but we can eliminate and bring it down to three possibilities. One is the simplest, which is uh, the, the nitrogen vacancy in HBN, not to be confused with the nitrogen vacancy in diamond, which is in fact a dye vacancy, maximally confusing. Um, but you know, it seems like, and all our analysis of this uh, defect was, yes, it's very common, it's very easy to form, but it is not at all stable under the electron beam. So as soon as you, you look at it, it's gone because it's so fragile. Okay, so that's that's uh, out of the picture. Um, by the way, these are, are you know kind of the, the strain maps, and with strain, I can do uniaxial, biaxial, there are all kinds of, of strain, and uh, we can relatively easily predict all of that. So the two options that we really, um, zeroed in on are the CBVN, right, um, and this O2BVN. Now, this O2BVN um, might seem like an unlikely possibility, right? You might look at it and say, well, it's a very complex defect. Why would this be responsible for such a pristine signature? It's got multiple different atoms involved. It's actually a defect complex. As it happens, that is a good thing because this O2BVN is not only stable to the electron beam and, and all of these other things, but in fact, it's also stable in its emission, perhaps all the way up to, to uh, room temperature. So we think that defect complexes, and this is the design principle we walked away with from uh, this, this project, was that in fact, if you have defects that are point defects, they're probably not going to be the reason for emission that, that is stable all the way up to room temperature. But the, the complexes, right, they're hard to form. They're rarer in, in a general sense, but that's okay. You don't need millions of these. In fact, you only need a few of these. Um, but once they're formed, thermodynamics does not want them to rearrange. And they exist, they're kinetically stabilized, and you actually see very robust emission from them. And they survive, you know, electron beam, they survive temperature, they survive all kinds of heckling. So in fact, for HBN, we think that looking at complexes and being able to now, and, and maybe a, a plea to, to uh, folks who can synthesize uh, some of these, you know, if you could change perhaps how much oxygen there is in the chamber, or you could somehow uh, very, uh, precisely introduce, say, uh, a handful of, of the atoms that, that we want, you might actually be able to uh, create a very, um, you know, controlled HBN-based platform. So rather than the current scenario where you find and hope, you might actually get to something that is controlled. But realistically, it's still a, a long road in hexagonal boron nitride. Okay. So hexagonal boron nitride is not the only 2D material that we're interested in. There are other 2D materials, and, and uh, in fact, uh, my host and, and somebody who introduced me, Andre, will say, you know, all these transition metal dichalcogenides is, is where it's at. So we looked at TMDs, 
And um, our first instinct was to say, can we actually figure out how does the TMD change when you have defects um, and you have these excitons? Like, what, how does the optical physics of the entire system change? Okay. Um, and with transition metal dichalcogenides, you have an advantage. It's a heavier system than HBN, right? Boron and nitrogen very light. Looking at them uh, under uh, the electron beam and doing various things is, is harder. TMDs have transition metals. Very good because they're heavier, easier to image. And in fact, not only can you image them, you could also, uh, with a combination of those same kinds of TEM images, do a bunch of reconstruction that looks very um, similar to, to what you would do in, in various other tomographic techniques. But you could take that tomography a step further and reconstruct to a point where for each of the constituent atoms, you can actually um, kind of with very, very, uh, you know, high precision, actually figure out exactly where it's located, not just in plane, but in 3D, right? So imagine in my stem column, I'm rotating or, or tilting things side to side, okay? That's enough information for me to be able to reconstruct where every atom that was in a particular plane lives in 3D, okay? If you're not convinced by that reconstruction, I can go over it in great gory detail after my talk. But for now, trust that I will actually be able to, with a bunch of those images and some magical reconstruction and some merging, actually for a particular system, know exactly the position of those atoms. So what would you expect from a 2D material? It's 2D. Everything should be in the same plane, right? Very reasonable expectation that nothing should happen in the Z plane. As it happens, that is the opposite of what we uh, ended up measuring and, and getting from, from the system, right? So instead of knowing very, very precisely exactly where the defects that we've introduced, here rhenium being the defect that we've introduced in MOS2, a very common TMD, um, instead of you know, everything being in, in, a, a, in the same plane, in fact, we realize as soon as you start to introduce these defects, the 2D material relaxes out of plane, and it uses that Z-plane variation to, to minimize its energy. So it no longer looks like a nice 2D material, which is why its optoelectronic properties also do not look like that same pristine 2D material. What I'm trying to say is, if all I, took, I did was take the 2D material and have those defects and say the defects will just be defects that introduce a little bit of distortion, I would be wrong. In fact, those defects modify the behavior of the entire system. And this is the first uh, report of, of that to, to the best uh, of our knowledge, and also something that allowed us to say a lot of things about proximity of some of these defects, right? So if you go back to, to a slide that I showed, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes ago, where I had this single qubit space and another single qubit space and this magical lattice, and they were sitting within some proximity of each, each other, right? What we wanted to realize that in, in, in what we wanted to do was realize that in MOS2 um, with these rhenium defects. But as soon as you have these two rhenium defects with, en with any proximity to, to each other, you immediately start to see something that looks very, very disordered. Okay? So this uh, amount of disorder that you're seeing here in the band structure, right? So usually used to seeing very, very nice lines. They're very, um, you know, they're, they're quite uh, separated and you can identify exactly what's happening in, in each band. Uh, so this is not a distorted image in, in the sense of being uh, poor quality. This is in fact what those coordinates from the reconstruction show you for the optoelectronic properties of this material. So this was a cautionary tale for us that as soon as you start building a quantum technology that's based on a 2D material, you really ought to think about what introducing these defects, these inclusions are doing to the pristine properties of the system before you start to, um, you know, incorporate that into a cavity and start to do other stuff with it, okay? So all of that, okay, fine. We wanted to um, turn this around and say, well, is there some advantage to using 2D materials? And this is, as it happens, yes. There, there is an advantage of using particularly these transition metal dichalcogenides. They have very strong spin orbit coupling. Um, and that actually, you can use the, use the fact that they have strong spin orbit coupling and electron phonon interactions to actually start to think about ways of quenching um, some of the, the um, pathways that would be detrimental to the behavior of uh, defects in, in these materials, right? So what you can do is say, aha, spin orbit actually uh, gives me access to multiple different phonon modes. Maybe I can gap out a particular phonon mode, which is responsible for the uh, emission I don't want and only stick to the one I do want, 
right? And uh, this is an example of where you could perhaps combine the, the material as well as the cavity with uh, some, some engineered, you know, a cavity here could be, for example, a, a photonic crystal and be able to, to modify uh, the behavior. Okay, so we did a bunch of stuff in this and might be a little too, too specialized for, for this setting, but to actually find a way of dynamically changing the, the local behavior of these quantum defects. I'm still stuck in this single qubit land, by the way. So in case somebody hasn't noticed, right? I'm still, uh, I'm trying to get to that two or three um, coupled defect, uh, coupled qubit scenario. And as soon as I start to do that, bad things happen. But if I can at least dynamically locally tune one, I have some hope of then trying to couple these and, and doing uh, useful stuff with it. Okay, so all of that was the optical properties, the structural properties, the disorder, right? But these are spin qubits. We're interested in them as spin qubits. In order for us to actually do something with them as spin qubits, I really ought to start talking about the various spin interactions that are of interest, right? Okay, so now um, back to our, our model Hamiltonian land, I have a defect, I still have a bath, but now for me in this bath, I need to think about the electron spin interacting with a bath of nuclear spins. So I'm no longer just limited to the decoherence being because of phonons or because of going back to uh, a photon mode that is not the desirable one. I have this additional complication of um, nuclei, right? And of course, I have then the interaction that is desirable. So now we can we can label our nice spin qubit here, the, the spin with electron spin with with the um, red arrow. We have these nuclei, the the blue, right? So I can talk about the zero field splitting. I can talk about a, a dipolar coupling and a Zeeman coupling with with nuclei. Of course, I also have the the electron term, and then I have this hyperfine coupling term, right? So there have been proposals, ideas put out there that if I have this nuclear spin bath, electron spins, fine, I could either get, I have, I could either get to a point where everything is isotopically pure, or I could use this bath to actually uh, be a reservoir for, for um, my electron spin, right? So one of them is much longer lived than the other, which is a useful thing because you could actually uh, do something uh, with it. Okay, so describe such interactions, right? Particularly the interaction of that electron spin with this bath. Um, you really need to go now to a density matrix approach. This is a little different from the kinds of approaches that we've been talking about in the case of the optical properties. There, we're really talking about, you know, uh, we have a, a giant matrix, we're treating the electronic states, we're talking about an optical interaction with electronic states. Now we're talking about, you know, how do we actually look at a very dense density matrix? <laughs> Uh, too much dense going on there, um, and actually talk about both the population dynamics and the decoherence. So talk about both the diagonal and the uh, off-diagonal terms of, of uh, this uh, density matrix. Okay, but to construct this and to do this in a meaningful manner, I'm going to make these small clusters, and I'm going to introduce an approach that we haven't heard about yet so far called the cluster correlation expansion. So what um, I could think of, and this is visually, I'm going to describe the visual part of it. Some people prefer the math, but I've, I've rarely encountered a large audience that prefers the math over the visual, okay? So um, the simplest thing I can do is put each of these in their own individual cluster. That's not going to make my life any easier, because now uh, as I grow this problem, I'm going to have a bigger and bigger problem, right? I haven't actually made clusters. Okay, but I could go to a, a scenario where I put, say, two of these, uh, uh, in, in a cluster, and I could think of pairwise interactions, and then I could talk about their interaction with uh, my, my spin of interest. I could make a bigger cluster of three, right? And now I'm not individually talking about them, and you see how this, this goes, right? At four, five, uh, so on and so forth. Okay, so um, in fact, the, the good thing about this method is that it's gonna give me um, you know, access to, to the spin coherence of, of my uh, defect, and it's going to very naturally include things like non-Markovian effects, because of course, I have the bath explicitly included, and nothing in this formulation in creating these clusters have I said about only a, a unidirectional flow of, of uh, energy or information. So backflow is perfectly fine. Uh, and, and of course, things like spin echoes, fields, et cetera, will all, all become possible here. This is all work that's uh, um, been, been done by Chris. Okay, so the simple CC method is one spin, uh, spin bath, right? But I've been trying to get to that two qubit scenario. I like, still need to, need to get there, right? So I'm gonna say, fine, let's actually introduce a generalized CC method where you can talk about clusters uh, that look as so. So the simplest CCE now is one blue and one red, right? I can keep them each individually, or I can make slightly bigger clusters of, of this sort. And what this allows me to do is talk about two electron spins that are now talking to each other, right? 
and also interacting with the nuclear spin bath. That looks a little more like this realistic scenario of, of uh, these being incorporated in, in some form of useful quantum memory. Right? And we can now do this explicitly. We can uh, account for the entire bath uh, and, and do both the population and the, the coherence evolution of this bath. So you can actually time step this and you can look at, you know, are there um, features or structures that appear within within the bath? Is there some preference? Is there, you know, coupling over time that changes? Because of course the bath has memory, right? So um, things coming back, going back, it's not, it's not a perfectly elastic process if you wanted to think about it mechanically, right? So, um, okay. So now I'm, I'm at a point where I have, you know, two spins, I can talk about them. I, I've gotten to that two qubit point finally. So um, in, in this, um, method and just a little plug for the method right so you are now talking about a space that combines uh, the density matrix of, of your each each of those spins individually of the bath um, and this method actually lends itself very well to now going back to that quantum embedding um, uh, point that i made most of those methods if you can get to this generalized density matrix uh, uh, concept you can actually uh, really coarse grain out yes there's a question yeah So this is to show that we are actually converged out, right? So this is showing that actually if I got to like bigger and bigger clusters, uh, I'm not going to get any additional information. And that's something that we wanted to make sure because if my uh, answer changes with how many I, I incorporate. And another way of thinking about it is that this is more than a nearest neighbor effect, but these clusters are sufficiently complex to capture the behavior of the entire bath. Not quite, no, no, actually, as it happens, um, the, and, and a very interesting question, so okay, so if I have four of the CCE ones, that's not the same as a cluster that's a, a CCE four at all, and in fact, to, to see that, um, so you wouldn't be able to see that on, on this plot, um, but yeah, we, um, not quite. So actually, this should be labeled as CC2, CC3, CC4, uh, and, and uh, further out. Um, and they don't complete. So, OK, so this scale is also maybe not ideal to, to show this. This is to show the convergence at long times, because these number of microseconds is essentially where we're you know, actually doing measurements. Uh, but if you actually zoom in to look at you know, short times, or you, you actually zoom into this further, you'll see that you want to go to CC5 just because that's a good cluster size, uh, but you're okay with CC4, but you're not okay with four CC1s. Yeah. Thank you, that was a, a clarification that I uh, yeah, should have uh, made as I go along. Okay. Um, so the, the you know, time scale we're interested in here already is like gotten to microseconds, but you know, colleagues who work on superconducting and other qubits will say that is still hopelessly small. You want to be talking about things that are uh, much, much longer. And that's where we get to, to things like control schemes, right? So we've been talking about qubits and decoherence, but ultimately we want to be able to make um, interfaces to something that's bigger and ideally much longer uh, lived. Okay, so our spin qubit is known for lots of things, but one of the problems is that it's living at the, the nanoscale. Everything we've looked at so far is really, really, really tiny. So making interfaces to it, eventually to make um, you know, some, some connection directly with a, a large platform like a, a superconducting qubit, involves really thinking about what kind of, of interface is generalizable. So if I go with something that is directly dipole mediated, that type of interface maybe gets me to uh, interfacing this qubit with other kinds of spin qubits. It's probably not going to be a good way for me to uh, get to other types of, uh, say, superconducting or, um, you know, really large platforms, right? So if you think about like something tiny and then you've uh, looked at uh, some of the, the resonators that people use when they talk about transmods, it's like a big size difference. So why would I actually want to connect a superconducting and uh, a, say, spin qubit platform? 
One of the reasons is there are ideas out there in how you could actually use um, the types of, of uh, spin qubit ideas we've been discussing so far as a quantum memory, perhaps even as a QRAM, right? So something that then allows you to not have to, to worry about all the qubits having all the advantages, but making these hybrid structures where uh, perhaps you have the fast gates of uh, uh, superconducting, perhaps you have the long coherence times that you can see in some other qubit, putting it all together, and perhaps if you could do this now with some kind of generalized bus, right? This is an idea that uh, engineers love a lot, some general interface, some, some generalized bus, life is good. Um, so in our fields, we're not at a point where we have some generalizable bus. We've all been trying to get there, either a, a photon or a phonon bus. There are lots of ideas out there for how you would actually uh, go about this. But I want to tell you a little bit about, you know, type of uh, interface or, or connection that you might not have thought so much about, which is something that is magnon mediated, okay? And the reasons to uh, try to do this in a magnon mediated manner. Um, I've done other work in, you know, phonon mediated and also other optomechanical um, architectures. I wasn't planning on talking about that here today, but if you're interested in that, you can, you can ask me about it um, after. Okay. So, if you go back to now a simplified picture of what our spin qubit looks like, right? Um, we, th these exist, and maybe now we can go back to something that's very well studied, like silicon vacancy in, in diamond. We don't have to stick with, you know, things that we already know, already are confused about in, in these 2D materials. We notice that they all have a strain susceptibility. There's some amount of inhomogeneous broadening that always exists, right? So they're not exactly identical, even though we say they're identical, they're slightly different. And you could actually use all of those things to create a, a nice uh, control scheme, right? So a control scheme here now is thinking of ways that if I put these, uh, put this uh, system in a, a cavity, or if I had some other way of externally controlling it, how would I get these two qubits to talk to each other? How would I individually um, address them, right? That's going to be important to make a quantum register or um, any useful uh, thing, thing out of these, right? So uh, this is, we're not, the, the first people to, to think about it. Uh, as it happens, there are various cavity-mediated interactions people have tried before, um, and, and you can do it reasonably well, right? You can couple these two SIVs. They've been really, really nice demonstrations um, that, that have shown, in fact, all the way up to what a small memory based on these would uh, look like. You could also think about direct strain modulation, right? So turn it around. The fact that you have the strain susceptibility, you have this inhomogeneous broadening, you can make that an advantage and actually, uh, say, do some form of uh, uh, control of these uh, defects with an external, say, cantilever or, or surface acoustic waves. They're all kinds of things that people have suggested uh, around that. So we found that to be actually uh, quite quite exciting and said, well, um, you know, you could actually use the fact that there is this broadening and you're in the dispersive regime of uh, say an optomechanical cavity to individually address these just essentially by uh, changing the frequency. So you could think of this as I'm just shouting at my defect and I'm able to address it, right? It's like your mom calling out to you. You can, uh, you have a name, you can be individually um, addressed, right? So, and in fact, as it happens, this this uh, optomechanical approach is, is quite general. So you can do this not just for diamond, you can also do it for the kinds of uh, uh, qubits we were talking about, more exotic ones in, in 2D materials, and uh, there's a very nice way of going from this with some small number of defects to actually uh, a small protocol that can, can uh, run on, on these uh, types of uh, situations. Okay, but I promised you that I'm going to tell you about something you've not normally thought about. You've all probably heard some talks on optomechanics or optical ways of controlling these. I'm going to tell you about how you could use a magnon to actually have some of the same things happen, right? Is, has anyone here thought about magnons in, in this context? I'm mostly looking at students in, in the audience. Anyone interested in magnons? Okay, cool. So this is going to be new. This is going to be fun. All right. So, um, you know, when we think about the types of, of cavities, we're so used to thinking about that picture of, of uh, Fabry Perot or thinking about like an optomechanical cavity that we forget that you could actually think of just a nanoparticle itself as being a cavity. Because essentially, all it's doing is taking, um, you know, some some excitation, it's confining that excitation. This is the simplest type of cavity people thought about, uh, you know, in early days of optics and, and plasmonics is uh, a nanoparticle, right? So, and, and if you go back to old talks from people in plasmonics, they show you the, the cup and, and all the, you know, various ways that people have been making particles for a very long time. Well, in the context of magnons, right, these are magnetic excitations that could um, 
be confined uh, that, that could exist and, and actually allow you to, to take something that's in the microwave and confine it to something that is very, very subdiffraction. Now, subdiffraction for optics folks has to be really, really tiny. Subdiffraction, when you're uh, you know, thinking about microwaves, can actually be very, very forgiving. So um, you could think of a fancy magnetic material. I'm going to think about a boring magnetic material, yttrium iron garnet, right? So you could, this could be any ferro or ferromagnetic material. I could make similar cavities. I'm going to make um, this nano cavity, which is still going to be fairly macro, right? This is on the order of about 100, 150 nanometer radius. So, so it's something that you could synthesize quite easily. And I'm going to use this to actually couple one of those emitters first to the magnon. And what I'm going to try to get to is couple two of those uh, spin qubits to each other without getting them to directly talk to each other, but via only the single magnon mode, right? Yes. Three minutes. Okay. I'm getting there. Um, so, so one of the things we found exciting about this, right, is that um, there are many, many modes you could couple to. We picked out a dipolar Kittel mode to actually um, couple and, and show that you could actually use this to couple spins to each other. Okay, so I'm going to skip the equations and how we actually went about it. It's all within the wigner weisskopf uh, approximation. If, if it's of interest, you can ask me about it later. Uh, the key result was that actually you could have those two SIVs quite far apart from each other. Remember, we said this is on... Uh, this is a, a fairly a macro scale nano cavity from the from, uh, standpoint of uh, nanofabrication. And then these two emitters are pretty far apart from each other, right? And we're using a single magnon mode, that omega over omega k being one, not all the other modes you saw in that spectral function, um, to actually couple these to each other. Now, the coupling here is in uh, kilohertz. So some of you might not be familiar with that unit as your working unit. Um, so I encourage you to. Um, realize that this is actually good coupling. It's not excellent coupling, but it's good coupling. The magnon mediated coupling actually is orders of magnitude better than what you expect from direct. That's, that's no surprise. They are actually quite far apart from each other. Um, and, and you can actually think of entire um, state transfer and, and you know, magnon mediated gates even uh, using that single magnon mode. So instead of now talking about an optomechanical external cavity or talking about an optical cavity, everything you could do there, you could do uh, with a, a magnetic cavity. So there are other ideas that build on this. And I got the, the three minute warning already, so I won't uh, try and go into too, too much detail uh, with these, but actually modifying some of the existing ideas in uh, a QRAM, incorporating some of the uh, magnon modes, and also going beyond YIG to other types of magnetic materials is uh, quite exciting. Okay. Um, and you can use it to relax selection rules. I'm not going to get a, a chance to, to talk about it. Um, but I want to spend maybe the last minute. Is, do I have a minute, Andre? Okay. To tell you that, you know, if you come back to a cavity and you think about not just the, the uh, qubits being uh, solid state with these defects, but also being molecular qubits, if you, if you allow your imagination to think about molecular qubits, uh, there's a, a lot you can do. Um, so the scenario I want you to think about now is, um, you know, two molecular qubits either spatially separated in the same cavity or sitting in two uh, separate cavities. You're coming in with, uh, some, you know, some coherent light. You, you are able to, even if you want to make it even simpler, say there's some entangled pair that's coming in, and I want to talk about how I'm entangling these molecules with each other. So this is something we've been thinking about, right? Because when it comes to molecules, you have options. So everything in our, our solid state qubit uh, scenario has been, uh, I would argue, uh, DV, discrete variable. But in the case of molecules, you could do everything, right? You could talk about this entangled pair coming in and entangling these molecules with each other in the context of continuous variable entanglement as well. And there's an advantage to do, doing that, right? Um, because in a molecule, you don't just have those electronic levels. You also have these nice vibrational levels. You can talk about it in terms of, you know, the bond length. And my, my chemistry colleagues uh, absolutely love seeing um, diagrams of this sort, um, but you have actually access to a lot of these different levels very easily, right? So these are not very highly excited states. You could actually um, get, get each of these vibration levels uh, to be distinguished from each other and, and uh, individually address them. Okay, so now in, in a discrete variable context, you would just have the modes, right? But in a continuous variable context, you have both the coordinates uh, 
the position and momentum of, of uh, each of these molecules. You can talk about the entanglement being transferred from the photon you came in with, the, the entangled light you came in with, to these molecules in, in both of those contexts. And we've been interested in this in particular because we're working on how you could come up with new entanglement measures that better represent these molecular qubits that are more useful for people working on molecular qubits, um, especially if you wanted to have this option of both DV and uh, CV. So folks are used to thinking about negativity, uh, you know, the extent to which the Paris uh criteria is, is violated. Um, but I think for molecular qubits, you know, even talking about the relative entropy of entanglement or entanglement formation, uh, which are slightly more exotic measures, but I think are, are um, more useful is uh, a good way to go. And, and I think, though I haven't seen any uh, experiments uh, towards this yet, but talking about such continuous variable entanglement for two molecules that are prepared in a cavity actually uh, lends itself well to interactions with uh, you know, the types of things now people are doing in cold chemistry. So they can prepare individual molecules, at least I've seen this uh, experimentally done, right? Um, you, you make it in the cavity itself, you can control it, you can do all kinds of measurements on it. So it's not um, too far to say you could create two of them. Of course, bringing in the entangled pair is, is the hard part. Um, but once you do that, I think you should be able to, to um, see you know, some of these in, uh, continuous variable type uh, entanglement experiments happening with molecules. <clears throat> okay, so before Andre uh, asked me to, to exit stage, I'll just say that, you know, uh, there was stuff on open systems I want to talk about, but I won't get to it. Um, I want to uh, acknowledge my group one more time. Thank you for your attention and uh, happy to take questions.